Hello. Good morning for me. Good afternoon to most of you. Um, welcome to this morning's, this afternoon's session <laughs> where we will discuss um, citizen science and environmental management and regulatory agencies, um, citizen science for policy. So really excited for a great panel and uh, virtual discussion today. I'm Allison Parker and I will be your chair. So during this workshop today, we'll review work by environmental management and regulatory agencies, both in the US and in Europe to support citizen science in policy contexts. Um, we'll open with some perspectives from the US, um, striving to provide infrastructure for expected projects. Um, and then we'll also hear activities carried out by some European environmental protection agencies um, with perspectives from their citizen science coordination forum um, with one specific example from the Netherlands. And finally, we'll close with a presentation of a European Commission document on citizen science and environmental monitoring. So really looking forward to four excellent presentations. Um, we'll start first with Jennifer Shirk, the uh, Interim Executive Director of the Citizen Science Association. And Jennifer, I'll let you introduce yourself further. Thanks. Great, and thanks so much, Allison. It's really wonderful to be part of this conference and part of this panel. I am serving as interim director for the Citizen Science Association based in the US, but the work that I'm going to talk about today is work I have done through my affiliation with Cornell University. And what I hope to do through this presentation is open up a conversation about what it really takes system-wide to do citizen science that meets the standards of working towards policies and policy change, particularly in management contexts. Uh, and I have a particular interest in conservation management, so that's what you will hear mostly about today. As more and more literature has supported and pointed towards, citizen science offers a really wonderful opportunity space for affecting change in relationship to policies and in resource management. In the US, there is a need for more best available information. It, that's the term that's used here in the US, so more data on which to make decisions. There's also a potential for developing shared understandings to inform policies, both with data and through other channels. Uh, the, the publication posted here is also linked at the end, so no worries about trying to capture all of that small text. I will be glad to share these resources. The big question, though, for a lot of agencies who are looking at citizen science is how to really affect this change. What is the system-wide support that is necessary to set appropriately high expectations for citizen science that meets relevant expectations for the agencies? And also what's necessary to support that? Cases have needed to be made, and I've been hearing from a number of people, uh, arguments needing to be made to administra administrators and agencies for having investment in supporting citizen science that we know can meet those expectations and an understanding of the costs and values associated with that. So it's with this in mind that I worked along with Rick Bonney in the context of the US Fish and Wildlife Service to undertake a question of what it would take to support citizen science within that particular agency. And along with Rick and under the direction of Jana Newman at the Fish and Wildlife Service, we did a review of other frameworks, what other people in the landscape were saying about the best practices and how to really turn best practices into action. So this is the synthesis of that review, basically saying that there are seven things that are needed to be attended to to support any one project. Uh, and those things are pictured here, thinking throughout the system uh, about participant engagement and sustainability, and then looking to make sure you're identifying goals, um, designing and refining the project, and so forth. But of course, when you ask, what does it mean to identify goals and how do we do those things? We have to expand this out to a much bigger picture. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. And it's complex and that is the point. Really that there is a lot to think about in supporting 
any one project or a set of projects that meet the goals that are set by an agency. And I don't want you to have to absorb all of this right now. The big question is really looking at this and how, um, how much is involved. How do you attend to all of these things? And what does it look like if you try to do that? And I'm gonna walk you through a case study of a, a different agency, a subset of an agency that has done just that. And this is where I start to talk about infrastructure. So Rick and I took this framework and were invited to work with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, which is a unit within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, that is tasked with collaborative stakeholder management of fisheries all throughout the US Southeast. And this is offshore fisheries um, and a very mixed uh, group of fisheries that include um, recreational fishermen as well as commercial fishermen and a whole mix in between. So in addition to having a really diverse fishing constituency, this particular council in this particular region has a lot of species to manage. There's a, it's a really diverse system. Over 80 species, I believe, are managed within this system. And the combination of uh, the number of species and the complexity of the ecology within that, as well as the limitation of the scientists available to look at what's happening over time, there's a real limitation of the data available to make good management choices. But there was also a real recognition that fishermen are out there all the time. They know the system incredibly well and have practical and relevant knowledge to share. And so the council set out to explore citizen science as a means to do data with uh, better information, more information to inform decisions. And long story short, the council started by convening around 60 people. And again, this is a diverse stakeholder group, sat them down in a room for three days to look at all of the things that Rick and I were saying needed to happen and decide what needed to happen in their setting and in their context. And again, long story short, they ended those three days with a mission and a vision to do uh, better science, better fishing, and better management by producing more data through citizen science. And although their vision and mission have changed from that original um, meeting, their vision and mission both still point towards better data and better information um, through citizen science for fisheries management. And that's a big task. What they set out to do right out of the gate was determined that they were not going to start a project. They were not going to undertake an individual citizen science effort to collect data because they wanted to be sure with everyone invested in this prospect that they were prepared for an initial project that was set up to succeed. There was a lot of trust being developed throughout this process. Um, relationships being built and a lot of um, weight hanging on fishermen investing their efforts in the prospect of collecting data that would actually be used. And instead of starting a project, what they did set out to do was start a program. And this is an effort to build the scaffolding and the structures and the rules of engagement to make sure that the data produced would be done with rigor in the development of the projects and the data that subsequently would result. And the fisheries management process does have very strict requirements of the types of data that can be used in the decision-making process. So it was incredibly important that everybody's efforts were focused on um, rigorous data as a result. I do want to point out that the rigor was not just in regards to the data, but to the entire process of developing a project. And I want to get into a little bit of those details here. But first, I want to paint a picture of how they approached a program, because just like the fisheries management that they do, the council set up a multi-stakeholder team 
to tackle the development of this project. And although there's a lot of complexity to the diagram, I want to draw your attention just to the volunteer action teams that were defined to move this effort forward. And these were uh, five teams focused on everything from data management to uh, working with volunteers and communicating about projects um, to financing the efforts that would result, really looking to the long-term and to the sustainability of these collaborations over time. At this point, I'm going to point out the work that each of these teams did towards those categories that Rick and I had defined as important for, appro uh, for appropriately supporting citizen science projects. And again, here is that grid, and there's a lot to talk about there, but the point that I want you to take away is that the work of each of those volunteer teams, and they're color-coded here, accounted for all of these categories. And this was informed by Rick and myself, but it wasn't prescriptive. So essentially each of these teams self-identified to do work that accounted for all of these uh, areas that are necessary to support citizen science. The open circles show that they talked about that area as important. The closed circles indicates that they developed products that specifically support that area of work. And I'm going to tell you what that actually looks like. The, the end of the early phase of this work, so the conclusion of these action teams efforts, which spanned over a year, was the production of a manual of standard operating policies and procedures for any citizen science projects that would be developed within the council. And this uh, procedures manual includes tools that can be used by the program as a whole and by individual projects to ensure that critical areas are attended to. And this includes things like a process for prioritizing the projects and the research areas that get suggested and pursued. It includes a process for endorsing a project, reviewing and saying that yes, it meets the criteria of the council. Um, standards for doing things like acknowledging volunteers and for training volunteers. Um, requirements for the data that are produced and even a plan for developing partnerships um, with other agencies and stakeholders who are involved in this. And all of these contents are online. Again, I will share this presentation so you can have these links. Um, there's a lot more in here. This is just a selection of things that they've done, but together all of these things constitute what, what the council talks about as a program and what I talk about as well as infrastructure, the pieces that then will support subsequent projects moving forward. The council has developed two projects and these are underway in various phases. I think they even have a third in the works now. They're very different in nature. One is an on the water app based project for fishermen to report fish that are released. It started with one, uh, with one species and now is being adopted by others for uh, looking at other fisheries. The other is an online project that is inviting anyone to classify images of historic fish catches to look at the, um, the catch indication of fish species change over time, if, if that can be seen. And that's on the Zooniverse platform. So they are moving forward to put this program into action. And the synthesis, the so what, the takeaway of this from the perspective of the council, again, as a subset of one management agency, is that the investment it took was the funds to support the workshop for 60 people and one full-time staff person devoted to this work over time. What they've gotten back out of that is the really dedicated work of 45 volunteers equating to over 50,000 US dollars of volunteer time, hundreds of pages of templates and manuals that projects can put into use and now these projects moving forward. The takeaways that I'd like to suggest for other resource agencies is that there is vast potential in investing in system-wide infrastructure that attends to the unique needs within a context. So what is necessary to support 
um, the infrastructure within a given agency, a given management agency. And that will, of course, look different from agency to agency. In the US, it's taking shape in different ways. And although this is the only case that I know of comprehensive review of infrastructure, agencies like the US Environmental Protection Agency has put in place policies for overcoming other restrictive policies like the US Paperwork Reduction Act that can stand in the way of working with volunteers. The US Forest Service has developed a toolkit and a mini grant um, program. And NOAA wide, the National o Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has just released and closed public comment period on a statement describing uh, what citizen science can and should look like within the agency. So the real takeaway I'd like to leave all of us with is that the, the development of infrastructure is an investment in the future of citizen science within a context. And I would like to invite each of us to think about the value of that investment, not just the cost, but what we can do now to support citizen science into the long term. And with that, I will leave you with some thanks to many, many folks and some resources again that I will share. And I will turn it back over to Allison to transition us to the next talk. Great, thank you, Jennifer, for that excellent broad look into the US context and in particular for that case study that I think really shows us the potential here for um, how effective citizen science can happen in policy contexts. Um, I'll pause really quickly to remind all of our audience that questions can be added to the chat um, and we will get to them at the end of the speakers. Um, we'll have a, a, a section for question and answer at the end of um, all of the presentations. So please don't hesitate to add any questions or comments there. Um, and I am looking forward to having all of the panelists together for that discussion. Um, we will move now to the to talk about uh, the interest group on citizen science of the European Network of Environmental Protection Agencies, um, and in particular, an example at the national level in Europe. Um, so we'll start first with Jose Miguel Rubio, who is a geospatial data manager at the European Environment Agency where he also acts as co-chair of the interest group of citizen science of the network of European environmental protection agencies. And then after that, we'll hear from Hester Volton, who works at the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment um, in the Netherlands. And she's an air quality scientist and specializes in citizen science. Um, and she's a member and a former co-chair of the interest group. So really excited to hear from you both. And I'll see you at the end of both of your presentations. Thanks, Jose. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Alison. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can, yeah, uh, you can see all uh, my screen. Uh, as uh, Alison has said, uh, I am uh, Jose Miguel Rubio. I'm from the European Environment Agency, and I am uh, I'm ex expert on data management, but I am also, I have to also the honor of uh, co-chairing the interest group on citizen science of the EPA network here in, in Europe. Um, after the very interesting uh, presentation uh, from uh, Jennifer uh, about the activities on the on the US side, US side. Uh, I would like to bring you back to to across the Atlantic to 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 Europe, and tell you a bit, uh, give you a bit of a flavor of what we are doing at the level of the European uh, Environment Protection Agencies in the interface with the citizen science uh, activities, and in particular, give you. Um, uh, some details about this uh, forum, uh, which is the interest group on citizen science, um, in which uh, several uh, Euro uh, environmental protection agencies, together with the uh, environment, European Environment Agency, we meet annually and we discuss uh, citizen science relevant topics uh, for the EPAs. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, the uh, network of the European Environmental Protection Agencies is an informal group of heads and directors of the EPAs, and similar bodies uh, across Europe. Uh, we meet uh, uh, in plenary twice a year 
and they uh, have a series of uh, interest group which discuss uh, topics of interest. And one of these topics of interest is citizen science. Uh, they uh, they set up this interest group on citizen science uh, six years ago, uh, with the main goal of achieving a greater understanding on how citizen science can deliver on EPA's objectives through on one side sharing good practices and try to assist each other in delivering successful citizen science projects, and also um, not just a focus on how citizen science can deliver uh, data, information, and knowledge for the EPAs, but also how it can go backwards and it can also go to empowerment, empower citizens, engage citizens in the overall goal of uh, protecting our environment. No? As I said uh, before, uh, the interest group uh, includes a series of uh, a number of EPAs across Europe, uh, total 14. Um, and the European Environment Agency, uh, together with the Scottish EPA, are the co-chairs of this group. Uh, we have a work program uh, in which we focus on three main uh, working areas. Uh, we uh, we want to investigate and to study and to analyze how citizen science is an instrument to gather evidence for uh, environmental policy development and implementation. In that sense, we have uh, contributed uh, to uh, the activities that uh, uh, my, uh, my colleague from the European Commission, Kim de Rijk, will tell us uh, later, uh, the best practice on citizen science environmental monitoring published uh, recently by the European Commission. Uh, we have also contributed to some discussions about citizen science and environmental compliance, and we are also interested in knowing uh, what is the contribution and how citizen science can contribute to the achievement uh, and the monitoring as well of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we are not only focused on, um, on, as I said before, on the on, on how citizen science is relevant for gathering evidence, uh, and data, and knowledge, uh, but also on how we can contribute uh, to engage citizens, uh, also in the context of the activities of the EPAs, uh, and empower citizens in order to take uh, sound decisions related to the environment. So we have also a strand of activities in this context, and uh, finally, we are also using this forum to, of course, exchange, share practices, that uh, share activities, what is going on at national level, at regional level, uh, and sharing also uh, together with uh, external actors, with citizen science associations, communities, non-European EPAs, uh, information and uh, news about uh, what is going on in citizen science, especially in the interface with environmental policy, environmental monitoring. Uh, well, I didn't say at the beginning, but I think it's, it's clear for many of you, and also Jennifer made a very interesting presentation on this topic. Uh, many uh, government and governmental agencies in this context, uh, environmental protection agencies are involved uh, since decades uh, in a number of citizen science uh, networks, citizen science activities, uh, both on the side of uh, coordinating them, but in many cases facilitating them, uh, and this is the case for many of the members of our interest group. Uh, we have the, uh, the case of the uh, in the UK, which are following the, uh, the activity of the rainfall observers. We have also some activities in the context of waste disposal. We have our Finnish colleagues, which Lake and Sea Wiki, about monitoring of the freshwater, the lake environment. Uh, we have also, and we will hear after my presentation, uh, the example of the uh, Dutch uh, National Institute on Public Health and Environment and their activities in the context of air quality. We have also other activities in the domain of biodiversity and so on. Um, we have, with all this background and with all the uh, experience that we have uh, in this uh, in this context, uh, reflected on uh, this is basically one of the main uh, topics uh, for discussion in the group. What is actually the role of citizen science in the EPA in the EPA's work? How EPAs can benefit from citizen science, but also how can EPAs benefit or contribute to uh, citizen science activities? No. Um, in one in one side, uh, we have of course um, identified uh, what are the key roles uh, for EPAs of citizen science. Um, we can say uh, that uh, citizen science is, is uh, critical, is key for identifying and gather further uh, further evidence on emerging and existing issues. Also, we have a 
pretty good consensus on, on, on the fact that uh, citizen science can provide recognition and gain trust in, uh, in EPAs through public participation. And also, as I said before, in empowering citizens to make sound environmental decisions. Uh, EPAs is themselves, uh, of course, EPAs are very varied and we have very different nature uh, of mandates, but uh, in most of the cases, we see ourselves as uh, facilitators, even if we are driving some projects. Uh, and when I speak about, uh, when I mention facilitators I'm, I think especially on, on funders uh, providing support in data management infrastructure also in terms of, of providing information about quality standards and procedures that th then can be provided to the citizen science community so the information that they are generating the data and, and the results of their activities can also uh, be used uh, uh, by the EPAs in their in their in the context of their mandate no? of course there are key challenges that we have identified and, and I'm sure we have, you have heard in, in other sessions during the during this conference, but the on one side data assimilation in the context of how we can integrate this information from citizen science into our, our traditional, uh, well-established uh, data sources and data flows, and also how to provide timely feedback to uh, to the citizen science communities and how we can make uh, these activities or their input that they give us uh, actionable in in our own in the context of our daily work. No? Uh, you will see, and I give you also a few examples later of uh, also strategies and guidelines that are uh, that the EPAs are working at national level, and that are also pro provided as a as a feedback uh, in the context of the interest group uh, work. Uh, as I said before, we don't focus only on citizen science as a as um, as a source of data and information. We we also consider citizen science as a powerful tool to open up a dialogue a dialogue and communication with the citizens. And in the in the <clears throat> last year, we have been uh, focused on trying to see how how EPAs can learn what uh, which which what. What does it mean a successful activity that empowers and builds trust uh, for citizens? No? Um, we we have identified a series of criteria, uh, uh, such as, for example, that the citizen science initiative needs to be relevant for the individuals uh, that are participating there, uh, that we have to make sure that there is a co-design process uh, in the context of, of, of involving uh, the different actors in partnerships, that it has to be open. Uh, we have to also be open in expectations and how we will be using this information, transparency in communication, and as I said before, actionable, that with this information, we can we can also uh, take steps uh, forward and come back to the citizens. No? And that those are um, some initial input or initial criteria that we consider that are uh, the key to successful activities that empower and build trust. Um, uh, of course, uh, we we would like to go on working on this on this area, and we like to to also work on examples of successful, but also not successful, trust building and empowerment projects, and extract some recommendations that we can then put forward to the to the heads of uh, EPA's uh, plenary. Uh, just to give you, and before I, I, I finish, just to give you uh, a couple of examples of, of activities in which our members are involved. Uh, maybe you will also hear about them in other in other sessions. In one side, we have, uh, as I said before, uh, we have a number of partners. Uh, two of them come from the UK, uh, the Environment Agency from England, and also from the Scotland, and they are part of the UK uh, UK Environmental Observation Framework in Science Working Group, which is a forum where with uh, other gov uh, with uh, the EPAs, but also with other government agencies in the UK, which is uh, quite similar, some so to speak, with with this forum at pan-European level, but uh, uh, at national level, where they share good practices, they discuss needs and promote the use of citizen science. They develop guidances to support good practice in in citizen science. They are available. I put here in the screen a few of them, but you you will be able to find it in the in the website of the of the citizen science working group. They also organize workshops with uh, government authorities, but also with communities. And they are also exploring um, 
the future steps for citizen science in public bodies, which is very similar to the discussion that we are having at, at the European level now, uh, around uh, especially uh, how to better integrate with existing monitoring, how to also uh, support uh, the data provision and use uh, and providing evidence to, to local decision making. They are also actually working on a very interesting paper on the impact of COVID-19 on citizen science and recommendations uh, forward. In the last uh, slide, uh, I would like to share about other activity, this, this time more on a pan-European level in which my institution is involved and is coordinating since 2014. Um, uh, this marine litter watch is, is focused about uh, focus on marine litter. Um, uh, this activity involves uh, 35 to 40 active citizen science communities across Europe uh, in cleanup, but also monitoring events. I wanted to mention this activity here as well because of the interesting uh, relation as well with environmental policy, because uh, the monitoring events, uh, uh, they are uh, the citizen science communities are using the same guidelines, the same protocols, uh, which are based on the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, guidelines for marine litter. Um, so they are using the same common protocols. They are also using uh, the mobile app in, uh, in a central database and viewer that are provided by the EA. And uh, they have, uh, the last uh, six years, uh, organized uh, more than 3,000 events and 2 million of items have been collected. You can find all this information in the website of the Marine Litter Watch in the EA website. And uh, what is also very important is that the analysis of this uh, data uh, is actually demonstrating uh, how uh, the value of this uh, information and this data collected by citizens for the implementation of existing policies uh, at pan-European level, like the Marine Framework Directive and also the strategic use of plastics in the definition of future strategic actions. So I think with this, I will uh, close my presentation uh, by uh, giving then the floor, uh, I think, to back to Alison Parker, uh, who will then introduce uh, the national case of, of, of uh, the Netherlands with Hester Walden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. I'll just move it quickly then to Hester, who I've, I've already introduced. Thanks, Hester. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the, the case of the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment. Uh, where I work and this is also about uh, an infrastructure to support citizen science. So this is our way to uh, make citizen science um, sustainable. And I will focus here on air quality because this is how we started, but the same uh, method um, also uh, can be applied to other environmental issues like uh, noise or water quality. And um, so we are in the process to upscaling. But let, let me uh, start a little bit more about why we started with, with air quality and uh, why we support this measure together. Um, so a little bit about air quality. You can see here, this is my favorite picture to show you the impact of, of air quality on health. Uh, you can see here the loss in uh, life expect expectancy. Uh, I like this picture because you, it shows you uh, the situation in the year 2000 and 2020. And you can see there is improvement, but still you can see that in certain areas, the, the loss of, uh, of life expectancy is, is quite substantial, especially in the Netherlands and also in Belgium, which is the price we pay for having the largest harbors in, in Europe. Uh, but And so it is a, um, an issue, air quality, that is very uh, dear to our heart because it has a huge impact on health. And we also see that a lot of people, um, a lot of citizen scientists are interested in it. So coming back to citizen science, how did it all start? Well, for me, it all started with a beautiful project called ISPEX. I was then uh, involved in a, 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 the development of a new instrument to measure particulate matter. And the, it is, was uh, around 2012 and the new iPhone 4 uh, came out. And my colleagues uh, that I was working with at the university decided they could make a demonstration of this larger instrument on the iPhone and it worked so beautifully that they said, we are going to do citizen science. 
So I immediately joined them uh, because I thought it was great fun. And I'm not going to tell you extensively about this project. If you want, you can look it up. Uh, but it was a great project. And we thought everybody was in interested and enthusiastic about it. And we were right. So uh, to be very briefly, the, the, the lesson we learned from this project was citizens are very enthusiastic about measuring uh, air quality. Uh, we had thousands of people participating. The scientific results were also beautiful. So we got a lot of pub publicity. We got beautiful scientific resu uh, results. And we, as an EPA, an Environmental Protection Asian Agent, we learned that our role in this was highly appreciated. People wanted us to be part of this project. And we could contribute by uh, uh, interpreting the data, by giving information on the data quality, and by giving background information on, um, on just what the issues are in air quality. So this was a very important lesson. But as is often the case, uh, you will learn most from the things that do not go so well. And one of the things that was very frustrating for me was that after this project uh, had been so successful, I was, you know, people were very enthusiastic. Uh, my director was very enthusiastic. I was in the newspaper. This was very beautiful. But my direct colleagues, so the people who are actually doing the air quality monitoring in the Netherlands, they were sort of like, okay, this is all very nice, as so you have been having a good time. This was, uh, this was nice. But now we have to do the real work. And so this project died out because my colleagues, my di direct colleagues, could not use this type of data for the uh, regular air quality, mo uh, quality monitoring. Since I also learned that citizen science definitely is very, very, a positive development and certainly has the future. I uh, went looking for a way that uh, we could uh, uh, change the situation and we could uh, make uh, citizen science uh, um, uh, compatible with our monitoring task. So we went from uh, the, uh, from a situation where citizen science and the national monitoring were completely uh, separate and not uh, uh, um, being uh, helping each other to a situation where we um, actually uh, try to make a situation where we as a national monitoring institute could help the citizen science by improving the quality of their data, by helping them uh, with the calibration, uh, giving them use of the, the reference measurements, and uh, by using the citizen science data to uh, get a higher resolution on our maps. So the lesson we learned is that we really had to focus on citizen science projects that could help us doing the monitoring and we as a monitoring institute had to find ways that we could help the citizens and this resulted in the infrastructure and the salmon maiden program or the measure together program well the measure together program um uh, uh, we started with um a, a, a website or, or a, a knowledge portal uh, you could say and uh, we we participated in a number of citizen science projects to find out what it was that citizens uh, um, needed from us. And that turned out to be information, information on what type of sensors are on the market, what is air quality, what are the substances you want to measure. But also we gave them a point where they could find other projects with, which was doing similar things so that citizen science also could use this uh, portal as a meeting point and exchange information even without us being part of that. Then after a year or so, we also find, found that um, we, um, um, uh, that the people were really uh, very keen of uh, sharing data with us. So we built a data portal. And on this portal, the people can uh, um, uh, upload their data, compare it with the data of the neighbors, but also with the uh, official uh, uh, reference data. 
And uh, this turned out to be really fulfilling uh, uh, a need of the people. And this is how it, uh, how the portal looks now. We have several hundred uh, sensors contributing to uh, the map of the Netherlands. Mm. You can click on the points and then um, you can see the underlying data. And on the right, you can see um, the, the map uh, which we make um using this data and where you can see that uh, uh the, the model calculations have more uh, detailed uh, uh structure because of the sensor data so this is really uh, a situation where um, uh, both the citizens and the epa win from the situation so to show you briefly uh, what kind of sensor data uh, we are uh, collecting on this data portal, I'll, I will show you a couple of citizen science projects that use the, the infrastructure we are, we are offering through the Sam and Nathan um, data portal. And the first one I would like to mention is the sensor.community, uh, um, also known as Luftdaten project, because uh, it is a project with a uh, in fact, worldwide impact. So most of uh, this this originated in the, in Germany. So that is where most of the sensors are located. But there are also lots of of sensors uh, located in in other countries such as the Netherlands or Belgium or Romania. And the sensors are re uh, relatively simple and uh, and cheap uh, uh, to assemble. And uh, this is really something. Um, that I, I feel a lot of EPAs all over the world could tap into. Because if you can make use of this kind of, of data and uh, acknowledge them and work with them, we can uh, provide something for them. We can provide a, a, a correction to the data to correct for uh, relative humidity problems. So this is really something we can, we can work together. And this has a huge potential also outside the Netherlands. But in the Netherlands, we also have some very nice projects. I'd like to show you this one. This is around a steel factory where uh, around 150 um, uh, sensors located. Uh, these are all sure. particular. Yeah, do I have to stop? I'm so sorry to interrupt. So maybe take a few, like another minute, and then we'll, we'll need to move on to the next presentation. OK, I'm, I'm almost finished. I, okay. What are you? What I would like to show you here is a uh, tool we've made uh, to help the people to analyze the data themselves. So uh, the, this is really the next step that uh, people um, are, uh, uh, we are en uh, encouraging people to, to really do the data analysis also themselves. So that they're not just uh, a place where you can hang a sensor, but they can really work with this data. And then there's also some bikes with sensors on it. So uh, I won't go into that for brevity and then uh, if you want to go uh, and see uh, what we are doing please visit the website and that's where i will stop thank you excellent thank you so much hester for that really that deep and broad look into some really impressive work with air quality i think that's really interesting how especially how it integrates with um, some of the epa work especially with reference grade data thank you and Jose, I really appreciated hearing about the um, interest group for EPAs. That seems like a, a really effective and interesting group. Um, and I'm glad we get to benefit from some of the lessons you've all learned. For our final presentation in the panel, we will now move to Kim De Rake, who's a bioengineer working at the Environmental Knowledge Team of the European Commission. Um, so Kim and her colleagues recently published the best practices in citizen science for environmental monitoring, and she'll talk about that now. Go ahead, Kim. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll make a bit of speed so that we can finish in time. Um, so yes, indeed, um, I work for the DG Environment in the European Commission, and um, as some of you may have heard already of a document a draft guidelines for citizen science uh, on citizen science for environmental monitoring and that was actually the working title of this document which has now been published in the middle of the summer as you can see um, and so the final title is best practices in citizen science for environmental monitoring and as jose already mentioned this has been a collaboration with the european environment agency and also other departments in the commission in particular research and the joint research center um, 
And so um, we have bundled all our expertise on citizen science to come up with this and also uh, involved stakeholders, as I will explain. Um, so what is the idea behind it is that uh, citizen science is um, very important and useful for environmental policy and in particular for the different steps in the policy making. And uh, as many examples have already shown and Jose has mentioned Marine Litter Watch um, and actually we just heard also about the salmon meat and the air, uh, air quality. Um, many examples have already shown that uh, citizen science contributes uh, to environmental policy in concrete cases. And it can be in the step of problem definition. For instance, Marine Litter Watch helped to identify what are the main items of, of plastic litter found on beaches. And from this, the policy um, against single-use plastics was developed. Um, uh, but also in further stages of uh, policy implementation and evaluation, um, but of course also awareness raising. Um, this is particularly the case in um, in the projects measuring air pollution, which has get generated a lot of attention. Also in Flanders, there has been the project Curieuse Neuse, um, which has also had a policy impact. There are also many projects um, in uh, the area of biodiversity monitoring, for instance, on birds, on butterflies and on invasive alien species that directly feed into official indicators on biodiversity that contribute to monitoring and that give feedback also on policy implementation. Uh, so these are concrete examples. Also in Sweden, you have Artportalen, which uh, among others also follows uh, the status of um, or contributes to the reporting on, um, on a, a red list species or on endangered species. Um, so um, as uh, the, the European Commission has also realized this, um, and in particular uh, in a fitness check or an, an evaluation which was done on environmental monitoring and reporting, one of the conclusions was in the action, and then this was um, phrased in the action plan that um, um, citizen science should be further promoted um, as an enhanced, as an additional, a complementary source of environmental information. And um, this is um, followed up by a study on citizen science, which has made an, um, an analysis of existing practices, see what works, what doesn't work, and um, identify the challenges, the opportunities, and made also uh, some um, suggestions for solutions. Um, this has led to the draft guidelines on citizen science, which have then been uh, consulted on with stakeholders. And I know some of you in the audience have been involved in this consultation. So we have uh, listened very carefully to what uh, practitioners in the field from the various domains, from also researchers and NGOs and local authorities, how they experience the, the problems or the hurdles in citizen science and possible uh, solutions. So this has led to our final document on best practices which gives recommendations um, and also proposes some um, concrete actions on what could be done to enhance and promote and facilitate the use of citizen science in environmental monitoring and also the impact of citizen science. So the scope of the document, and at the end of my present presentation, I will give you the, the URL where you can find it. Um, the scope is first, uh, it gives an overview of the citizen science landscape um, and uh, highlights good practices and the les lessons learned from that, uh, the benefits and the challenges. And then the most interesting part, in my view, are the recommendations and the possible actions. And we have targeted the, specifically the key actors in the field of citizen science. Um, that is um, among them, the EU authorities, uh, the Commission, also the European Environment Agency, Public authorities in member states uh, at national level, but also regional level. This also includes, for instance, um, environment agencies and statistical offices. Uh, there are researchers are also important players in, in uh, universities and other research institutions. There are the citizen science communities. These are the real um, uh, practitioners, the people actually doing citizen science. And then um, the citizen science associations and networks such as EXA, but also there are many um, a national or even at a regional and more local level, uh, many networks uh, that promote citizen science or that help citizen science projects. The benefits and the challenges, um, I will quickly go through them. Uh, 
known benefits of, of uh, citizen science is that they improve the knowledge base, um, provide information that could um, not be covered by um, official monitoring alone. It's very, in many cases, it's very cost effective. There are even studies about this. It's not for free. Citizen science is not um, for free. It also requires an investment. Uh, the granularity is often much finer than what can be achieved through official monitoring. There is, it's already been mentioned, citizens empowerment, engagement, um, awareness raising also, networking, uh, emerging issues uh, such as pollution, for instance, at local level can be sometimes faster spotted uh, by citizen scientists. And it also contributes to a culture of inclusive and open research. Um, the challenges, I think many of them have already been mentioned um, also in previous sessions, uh, the, the continuation of resources uh, that is needed. There is a certain reluctance among public authorities to use citizen science data uh, because there may be questions about um, quality of data. How to link, find linkages between uh, citizen science um, initiatives and the policy needs feedback to citizen science uh, achievements when they are used and then all the technical um, issues on data heterogeneity scalability integration accessibility licensing um, governance issues of project and scaling up and how to sustain engagement and these are just a few there are many more um, so coming to recommendations we've split them or yeah roughly over four areas um, I think the document contains nine recommendations and 18 actions, so I'm not going to list all of them, but this already gives a broad overview. Um, we focus on matchmaking between the knowledge needs for policy and the citizen science activities and how what activities can be done to improve this, how to promote awareness and trust and recognition in both direction um, between policymakers and citizen science communities. Um, how to promote data quality and interoperability standards and sharing tools, and how to support coordination, collaboration, and resources for policy impact. So um, you can find the uh, very detailed list and descriptions of recommendations in the document. I have picked a few um, as examples uh, for, and I also mentioned to which um, key player they are targeted. Um, for instance, for citizen science communities, what could they do? It would be helpful um, if they communicate transparently on the methodologies they use and um, adhere also to good practice on data quality and um, data governance. Um, this would help build trust and confidence uh, towards public authorities to also make use of the data. And it creates transparency about um, how the data is um, is collected and managed. For citizen science associations, and to a certain extent this is already um, happening, it would be helpful that there is an online knowledge base um, on citizen science activities across Europe and also on tools and resources that can be shared online. A lot of uh, material is being produced by citizen science projects and by networks and um, a lot of synergies can be created, a lot of overlap can be prevented, a lot of duplication of effort can be prevented if all of this is shared on an open um, basis and I know that uh, networks are already working to do that. Um, so we definitely um, encourage that. And also to promote the coordination of citizen science activities initiatives at different levels. Um, this does not mean to put a central level of coordination, but rather again to look for synergies, scaling up uh, collaboration in, in uh, opportunities. So that is what citizen science associations can contribute to. For the authorities, there are also things uh, to do. Um, both at the EU level and in member states and regional level. And um, for instance, to support initiatives in specifically in the priority areas of the European Green Deal, which you probably have heard of, which is the big environmental um, priority of the European Commission, uh, the von der Leyen uh, Commission. And it covers areas such as pollution, biodiversity, climate change, circular economy, and sustainable food and agriculture. And there are um, significant knowledge gaps still to further develop policy, for instance, on biodiversity, on pollinators, in order to protect bees, bumblebees and butterflies. We need a lot more information and more 
much more detailed information on, on the state of pollinators, how they evolve, how they respond to environmental sorry influences. And um, official monitoring activities can never cover this kind of, uh, this level of detail and geographical uh, spread. So we really need citizen science input on um, in such areas. Um, authorities can also help ensure that official reporting mechanisms on environmental um, for environmental reporting can accept and integrate citizen science data and um, also authorities should communicate clearly about the data quality requirements and methodologies that are um, that are needed in the different policy areas because this can change from, or be different from one policy area to another so here is also and um, an information need towards citizen science initiative so that they can also take this into account if they want their um, initiative to have impact on policy. And for all stakeholders, and this is uh, uh, already mentioned several times, it's important to co-create activities and to foster strategic partnerships, for instance, uh, to include academics or researchers in general in projects to, to improve data quality. Um, also, local uh, authorities can be uh, interesting partners for the sustainability of the project and also the possible um, policy impact. Mm. And I think that already brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. So there, this is here the link where you can find um, the the best practices, but if you just Google the title, you will also uh, find the PDF of the document. It's available on the Europa website of the European Commission. And if you have any other specific questions, you can contact me. But you will see it's a quite extensive document. There's a lot of um, more detail in it than I have been able to explain now. So I definitely recommend you to, to look into it and see what's in it for you. Voila. Great. Thank you, Kim. All right, well, we have only about five minutes left and we have lots of really great questions in the chat. I think I'll sort of introduce one or two um, and hear a few words from some of the panelists. And I think I'll go ahead and suggest that if anyone wants to continue this conversation that we head over to the Zoom social channel um, and, and see if we can maybe talk about this a little more um, for anyone who is available. Um, so there's a thread going, uh, well, there's multiple threads going in the chat, but one is, um, was first brought up by Rosa who, who indicated that EPAs can have a key role in helping with the sustainability of citizen science projects. Um, and then others built on that point, such as, um, Mookie suggesting that it could be a path from sort of research projects to adoption and use by EPAs. Um, and then Martin also suggesting um, that there may be opportunities to broaden it even further to think about how citizen science can then be built in to the work of environmental protection agencies. Um, so let's spend a few minutes on that one. Does anyone on the panel want to uh, chime in on those points? Um. I, I could start and then maybe give the floor to uh, Hester as a, in national level or maybe to Kim as well. Uh, indeed, I mean, I think there is a need to make sure that there is a connection between the uh, outputs of uh, citizen science research projects and the work that we are doing at the EPAs. Uh, you, uh, I mean, we have to understand that uh, most of the work that we do at the EPAs is uh, on an operational level. Of course, we also have some departments focused on innovation. Uh, what is very important is to make sure that the, all these activities that, going, that are going out, out there, that we really know that they are happening. And that's why this is uh, one of the main recommendations that is included in the best practices that uh, Kim included uh, to to uh, to make sure that we have an overview of, uh, of what is going on out there, the different activities, access the data, to be able to analyze the information, to also to to see how this fits as well in the EPA's uh, mandate. Maybe if any other wants to comment as well. <laughs> well. 
should I comment something? Um, I think the, the, there has been a very rapid development for the last couple of years of uh, on the development of the sensors. They have um, really improved quite a lot. So I, I think you cannot really blame EPAs for not using sensor data, but uh, um, I think uh, that very soon they will see that it is uh, for their own profit to, to start using it. And then it will depend on each country uh, on, how, on how to implement that. And by giving some nice examples and by sharing uh, different ways to do that, uh, we hope that, that eventually uh, different countries can pick it up uh, themselves. Of course, it would help also if it, on a European level, this would be made more attractive. Uh, excellent. I think I should probably wrap up there since we've about run out of time. But I'll mention again that we can keep talking over in uh, the Zoom social channel and also just in general, we can uh, get, in, get in touch with each other um, and throughout the rest of the week. So thank you again to all of our panelists. This was an excellent session and I wish we had more time to really get into it. Um, and so we'll just continue that offline. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.